Well, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Javier Ballesteros Paredes. Uh, I would think he needs no introduction, but uh, I, I'll try to make one anyway. Uh, Javier got his degree uh, uh, at the end of the last century. <laughs> uh, he, he was my, that, that already sounds terrible, but, but that's what happens for most of us. Um, and uh, he, he was then my grad student. Now he is uh, my esteemed colleague. And um, and after fin before finishing his degree, he did like a pre-doc uh, stay um, uh, stay at uh, in at the CFA, where he started working with Lee Hartman, and from which uh, a, a lifelong collaboration has ar arisen between the two of them. And and after finishing, he did a postdoc. Um, uh, I think, yeah, in at New York uh, at the Museum of Natural History with Mordecai McLeod. So, uh, so he he has had uh, um, very uh, valuable valuable colleagues, and I think we all uh, consider him uh, also a, a very uh, revolutionary uh, astronomer, so to speak. One of his most famous papers is one called uh, Six Myths on uh, on the Burial Theorem, and uh, one one student at one at one conference once told me uh, that he really liked that paper. So uh, it, it's a paper that makes us think about what the virial theorem means. That was his dissertation topic, and he has been continuing to study the energy balance in in molecular clouds. And today he's going to talk to us about again, the energy balance between turbulence and gravity uh, on the basis of some observations with Gaia. Javier. Thank you, Enrique. So um, let me then go uh, direct to my, to my screen. Uh, soon that I cannot uh, share screen. Oh yeah, one second, I'll fix it. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. Here we are. So, if uh, I, I hope you you can see my screen now. Uh, if not, please let me know. So the the title of this talk is "Gravity or Turbulence: Biomimetic Relaxation in Orion." So, uh, the main collaborator of this work is is Andrea Bonilla Barroso. Uh, she came to Morelia when, when she still was finishing her, her uh, undergrad thesis, his bachelor thesis, actually. At, at that time, she was working on neutrinos in, in, in the Antarctic. Uh, Antarctic. Um, but then I convinced her that, that there will be much more interesting things to, to do with molecular clouds. And then she decided to, to, to continue to do the master with me. So she's been a, a very good student sometimes. She gets a little bit, uh, how do you say, enredada in Spanish. Uh, I don't know how do you say, entangled maybe. Uh, but at the end, I think she, she does very nice work and, and she's very, very um, hard worker person. No? Um, well, uh, some of the collaborators are Jesus Hernandez. He, he knows uh, a lot of observations. He knows very well the Ryan Nebula cluster. So he, we started with, with project with him because we were planning to, to analyze the, the uh, besides the numerical simulations, also uh, the Orion Nebula cluster data. Uh, we also invited to work to different people that, uh, used to work with, with numerical simulations. So Veronica Lora, uh, she was at, at uh, our institute uh, until recently. Vianney, uh, who is now in Atinaoe. Manuel Zamora, también, uh, also is, is Atinaoe. And Alexandra Kuznetsova, who is not right now, she was a former student of, of Lee Hartman, now is uh, in the Museum of Natural History. They were making sim different simulations. We made use of those simulations. Uh, of course, also uh, Luis Aguilar uh, has been part of this of this work. Uh, I will explain how he came into this work uh, and suggested interesting things. And also, of course, uh, Lee Hartman, who always uh, has very clever and interesting uh, things to to add to to the topic. So, uh, as an intro, let me tell you that 
there are two scenarios of uh, cloud and star formation. One is the turbulent. Most people uh, used to say that the clouds are turbulent, that the turbulent motion support the clouds. Uh, and more recently, we have been pushing this other idea in which the turbulent motions are actually consequence of a global collapse. Uh, the collapse is not spherical and is, is disorder. So uh, in that sense, uh, it, it, it may look like, like if it were turbulent. So uh, in the turbulent scenario, people used to think that clouds are long lived and they are supported against gravity by these non-thermal motions. Uh, for many freefall times. So the, the, the drawing, the, 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 the cartoon of this, uh, of this idea will be that you have a cloud and you have motions, uh, random motions in different directions and that prevents a global collapse of the cloud. Uh, in this different scenario, uh, people agree that clouds are in kind of a real equilibrium in the sense that the gravity and the kinetic energy uh, are more or less of the same model of magnitude uh, in a near real uh, equilibrium. Uh, but I used to say that this just said in, in this way is kind of a magical real uh, equilibrium because there is no, in principle no reason if, if gravity doesn't dominate, there is no reason why the kinetic energy knows that it has to be half of the gravity of the gravitational energy on one hand. On the other hand, uh, the the gravitational, sorry, uh, the gravitation, the, the Debian theorem, sorry, uh, no, not only involves the gravity and the kinetic energy, but also many other terms, surface terms, internal energy, magnetic energy, and also this time, second time derivative of the moment of inertia, in, in which uh, if clouds are, are experiencing uh, turbulent motion, so most bulk motions, then there is no reason why the, the, moment, the, the moment of inertia has to be, it has to have a second time derivative equal zero. The, the, it could be whatever else. So uh, in order to understand our picture, the picture that clouds are collapsing, you must understand how clouds are formed and, and, and what is the connection of this cloud formation with star formation. Um, for this purpose, well, uh, Enrique and his team and Fabian H uh, and his team uh, have been working on, on, this, uh, on this issue, uh, proposing that clouds are formed by large scale compressions. Uh, in, in this uh, picture, you can, you can imagine that the flows are coming from the, from the left and from the, and from the right and converging this uh, in a region uh, in the left hand panel, I have uh, the whole density field. In the right hand panel is the same field, but only the dense gas. So if you let it evolve, uh, these flows converging, then you see that, that the cloud grows in mass. And at the time, uh, as it grows in mass, it becomes denser and denser, and it starts collapsing, not only locally, but also uh, globally. You can see that the cloud is contracting also in the, in the plane of the, of the screen. So all this, uh, uh, this is the way in which clouds, uh, we believe that are, are formed. Uh, there are evidences for that. And, in, and something interesting in this picture is that as clouds collapse, as the cloud is collapsing, the kinetic energy and the gravitational energy behave like, a real, uh, uh, like in real equilibrium, like what we call wrongly, I guess, equilibrium. Um, in the sense that the, the gravitational energy is a little bit larger than the kinetic energy. And uh, in fact, as, as, as gravity becomes important, then the kinetic energy follows it. This is just consequences, consequence of collapse. So the reason why we see clouds in apparent real equilibrium is because they are collapsing. You can do this also using embodied simulations. It's not, it's not a, this is not a problem of having gas, it's, it's problem of having a collapse. We, uh, in these uh, simulations by, by Hector Noriega Mendoza and Luis Aguilar, uh, they made, they started with some cold conditions, I mean, with, with conditions, subvaria conditions uh, of a of stellar cluster, just embody dynamics and let it evolve. And what they saw is that after one freefall time here, uh, oh, sorry, I, I thought it was here. Um, about one freefall time, which in these units is like, uh, is around seven, you get that the real ratio, this is kinetic energy, this is gravitational energy, uh, converges to one. So, so 
collapse per se means uh, or, imp or, or implies after one free fall time implies that the cloud have clouds have to be uh, in sort of real equilibrium okay so as i told you the group of enrique and the group of fabian uh, and lee hartman uh, have been working in this uh, construction of clouds from from the beginning from the diffuse medium uh, i i happen to be in both groups somehow so so I, i'm glad that they both included me at the beginning they were talking about collapse and i didn't believe because i was so so uh, engaged with the idea of, of cloud being turbulent but they convinced me uh, and there is also more people that uh, that have been uh, uh, entering into into this idea of of clouds collapsing. So as the, the group of Maglo, Daniel Seifer in Germany, and so on. So uh, for a global summary of this issue, you can uh, check this paper. Uh, it's an APJ paper, but it's very complete. It's it summarizes the the whole idea. So. Uh, uh, to give you a, a global picture, well, molecular clouds are formed by, by large scale H1 streams. Uh, once the gas becomes molecular, then it becomes also gravitationally unstable. This is something that was actually computed by Pepe Franco back in uh, 80, sorry, 1986, uh, and, and we also revived somehow in 2001. Um, the collapse is not monolithic. It's not that the whole cloud is going to collapse into a single point, but the, the cloud has a structure. So there are local collapses, but at the same time, the cloud is also contracting globally. So there are different time scales and different, different spatial scales in this process. And of course, uh, there are criticisms to, uh, to this model. And uh, some of them have been summarized in this uh, annual review paper by, by Mark Kronholz. Uh, and some of the uh, or, or the main criticisms that that have been posed to our model um, are, are outlined here. So first of all, well, they say, well, okay, collapse is fine, but if clouds collapse, then during collapse you should see the stars converging into a single point, and then when the, once the cloud is dispersed, then the, you, you have an overview uh, cluster that should be showing traces of expansion. Okay. That's fine. And, and also they say, well, you know, uh, you can compute how fast or what is the expansion factor. The expansion factor is defined by the average of the, the dot product of uh, between the velocity and the position. So at some point you have some star that can be going away or coming by, uh, uh, into the cluster. And if the, the velocity and the, and the position have the same sign, then it will be positive, the, the cloud will be expand, expanding. And if they have an inverse sign, then it will be contracting. So you can compute the average of this quantity and then say uh, if whether the cloud is, uh, or the cluster, sorry, because it, this is for stars, uh, whether the cluster can be expanding or not. Okay, so in this case, during collapse, you will have negative expansion factors and you, during the dispersal, you will have positive expansion factors. And the Orion Nebula, by the way, has almost zero uh, expansion factors. So, so how, how can it be? So it has to be turbulence because turbulence has random motions and, and, um, and there is no signs either of contraction or, or expansion. So as you see, Orion should be turbulent. Uh, also for, the, for Orion, uh, this discussion was built up uh, based on, on, on Orion. Uh, Mark Kronholz, you said some uh, analysis by, by Marina Kunkel about the ages of the stars. So uh, here is the nebula, the, the Orion Nebula cluster is, is just in this very small uh, circle, which is expanded here. And uh, so let's take a look of this, uh, of the histogram of ages of this region and the other one that it's a little bit larger. So in, in these two cases, the uh, HE histograms are these ones. This is in logarithmic uh, scale. So this is 10 million years, 1 million years. And, and what you can see is that the, the histogram of the inner region is very flat, showing that there, are, there is a substantial uh, portion of stars that have ages close to 10 million years, maybe six, six seven, eight million years. So, and that, according to Kromholz, is means that the cluster has many free fall times because the dense gas in Orion will collapse in a sky in the scales of one million years more or less. So 
For the student, the free fall time can be computed in this way. Uh, see, if you have the density, then uh, you divide it by 10 to the two, uh, uh, take the square root, divide it, and multiply it, uh, the result by 3.4. 3 so at a density of 10 of 1,000 particles per cubic centimeter, centimeters, you will have 1 million year of free fall time. So the ONC, the Orion Nebula cluster, is much older. It's six, seven, eight uh, times older than that. OK, that's another criticism. And also, another criticism that has been posed is that the stellar clusters are much more denser than the parent molecular cloud. So, so Cromwell says, argues, well, how a cluster can get denser that the parent molecular cloud. If this is collapsing, the gas has to be dense. It forms star there, but the density should be uh, comparable. Here, the, the blue points are the are, uh, data uh, for, for clouds in the galaxy, and the uh, orange uh, data are, uh, the, um, are the, the, the sizes and the masses of um, stellar clusters. So, uh, if you if you compute the densities from here, you will conclude that all cluster, all, every stellar cluster is denser, a lot denser than whatever uh, molecular cloud in the Milky Way. So uh, finally, uh, another thing that has been uh, uh, posted to, 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 to our scenario is that efficiency per free fall time is small. Uh, and if you have collapse, the efficiency has to go large. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's see what happened. No, uh, for this purpose, then uh, we say, well, is, is it turbulence or is it collapse? And whether we can uh, use Ga the Gaia data in order to disentangle this this controversy, whether uh, clouds and clusters exhibit evidences of clouds being turbulent or in collapse. Um, for this purpose, well, and uh, this is what, actually the idea of, of Andrea's PhD thesis, and I, I think she, she's doing a very good job. I'm not sure exactly what she means with this sign. Maybe she was tell, trying to tell me something personally. I hope not. She was just showing her strength. So anyway, uh, the idea of uh, was to use uh, Gaia proper motions to see whether we can see signatures of collapse, expansion, or whatever. Uh, and we were uh, expecting this, this kind of results. In the case of the turbulent scenario, well, the, the star should have exhibit random motions, while in the case of collapse, uh, you will have local collapses, and also maybe uh, we, we could distinguish global collapse among different clusters, nearby clusters uh, from the same cloud. So there was only a small problem that newborn, star, newborn stars in, in the star formation regions, most of them should be highly embedded. So this phase of contraction is, is really hard to, 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 to detect because you will need um, infrared observations of proper motions, which is, are not available nowadays. No? So Gaia is observing in, in the visible, so you cannot see embedded clusters. You cannot measure. Uh, uh, proper motions of embedded clusters. Uh, Andrea was presenting this, uh, this issue uh, in her, um, uh, to her committee of uh, uh, during the, uh, how do you say, the, the, the candidature. And at some point, Luis Aguilar uh, who was part of the committee and he told us, well, you know, you have a process of collapse, then you, you should have a, a signatures of violent relaxation. And violent relaxation means that the velocity dispersion of the stars should not depend on the mass of the stars. Uh, we weren't aware of that. This is an old result. This is an 80, sorry, 1967 uh, result by Linden Bell. So um, the, the, the idea is maybe you can measure in your simulations the velocity dispersion of the stars and see whether this is uh, this velocity expression depends or not depends on the mass, no? And maybe we can also measure that in Orion uh, using Gaia, no? Um, in the case of the turbulent scenario, then uh, typically people uh, believe that the most massive cores, uh, sorry, the, the most massive stars are born in massive cores. Uh, this is a kind of, uh, of, of the, the belief that, that uh, 
that it's in, in, the, in the community. So here I have two examples of massive cores in which you have H2 regions uh, produced by massive stars. Uh, the, the left one is Monoceros, this one is Orion. Uh, so uh, then uh, the, the question will be, okay, if massive stars are born in massive cores, uh, what happened to, uh, or, or how do you form massive cores? Well, massive cores in the turbulent scenario are formed by stro strong turbulent shocks. So to, to make a picture of this, you have here a massive cores represented in blue. Uh, you have a strong shock compressing the gas and forming this massive core. And then inside here, you will have massive stars. On the other hand, the low mass stars can be formed also here, but also in smaller shocks, in shocks that are less intense and, and, and produce cores that are less, less, less massive. So in this sense, uh, the, the Mach number of these, of, the, of these regions will depend on the, sorry, the, 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 velocity, the, the density jump, the, the density fluctuations uh, for isothermal gas, which is the case of molecular clouds, will depend on the square, uh, on the second power of the Mach number. So these guys should have, in principle, larger velocity dispersion because they are produced by larger shocks, by stronger shocks. And these other guys will be produced by small uh, Mach number shocks. So that could make some distinction between, between one scenario and the other. So if you, the idea is that in the case of collapse, you have constant velocity dispersion of the stars as a function of the mass of the, of the stars. And in the case of the turbulent scenario, you will have that the massive stars will have larger velocity dispersion just because you are producing them uh, via larger, uh, larger Mach number shocks. So this is what we were expecting. The idea uh, came from, from Luis Aguilar. Uh, so we uh, make this group uh, in which we analyze the simulations from, from every, everybody. Uh, Vero was uh, contributing with embodied simulations. And these other three guys were contributing with simulations uh, uh, of uh, uh, MHD simulations. So the simulations that we use were simulations of cold collapse. So just make a cloud and let it collapse. So this is kind of artificial, but anyway, you can, you can make a cloud, let it collapse and see what happened. The second case were these colliding flows that I showed you uh, uh, previously. And finally, we also made uh, simulations of uh, turbulent clouds. On the other hand, we also wanted to use the observational data from Gaia. So for that purpose, uh, Jesus Hernandez uh, was, was uh, the expert on this. The, for, for the students, well, the Orion Nebula is, is here. This is the, the, the Orion Belt, the constellation of Orion. Um, and well, uh, of course, Lee Harman, who also knows very well the observations and, and always has uh, interesting comments. No? The, the, if you make a zoom of this region in infrared, then what you get is this structure. The grayscale is the cloud uh, in, 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 I think it's Herschel. And here uh, you have in red the most embedded uh, sources, protostars, and, uh, and the, the young stars are uh, in, in green. So the, the very cluster is around here, the, the, the Orion Nebula cluster. Uh, so for that cluster, we use two different regions. I'm not going to enter into much detail, but we use Gaia uh, EDR3 data and also complete this, uh, our catalog with another two different sources in order to have enough statistics. So all this work was made by Andrea. Andrea has been, I believe, a very good uh, work understanding and, and working with either observational and, and numerical data. And she, she has made such a great work that even important people want to dance to, with her. So the results. Uh, what we were expecting, as I told you, in the case of collapse, is that the velocity dispersion doesn't depend on the beam mass of the stars that you are considering. And here are the results of the numerical simulations. 
Uh, those are different simulations. These, for instance, are simulations using the colliding flows. These are different setups of cold collapse, these uh, three first, uh, first fronts with different initial conditions. Then for the, for the turbulent simulations, we were expecting that the velocity expression increases with the mass with the beam mass of the stars. And indeed, this is what we observe in the simulations using different Mach numbers. And it's not that we are just using one simulation, but we repeat the case many times and then take the, the average here. So what happens in Orion? Orion, uh, this, this is kind of a proof of, of, of our idea. And what we found is that indeed the velocity dispersion per mass beam in the in the in Orion, either in the compact region or in the large region, is uh, is nearly constant. There are fluctuations, of course, as in the simulations, but it's nearly flat in uh, the, the velocity dispersion. So this is signature of collapse of, of violent relaxation. Um, so what about the questions that I showed you, the, the questions that have been posed to our, uh, to our model before? Well, let's see. The first question that, that has been uh, posed, or the, 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 first, the first puzzle is that during collapse, you should see inward motions. And then you, after you, you dissipate, then you see outward motions. OK, well, let's, uh, ah, well, and the Orion Nebula has a very small expansion factor. Well. In the case of the simulations, here is the, a picture of, of what happened. You have, a, in this case, we have this, uh, this simulations. The dense, in the densest regions, we start forming stars. All these circles represent uh, stars. Uh, in many of, this, of these cases, the, the circles overlap because there is a small cluster that is forming several stars inside, but, but the, 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 the circles are large and then, then the stars overlap. Uh, and as time goes, this is the first frame, the second, third, and fourth frame uh, in units of uh, the freefall time, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1.1, 1 .1, and 1.3. And you see how the stars are forming around the densest region. But not only that, also the, uh, there are small clusters that are nearby and they merge together. So in this process of merging together, of course, at the beginning, uh, the, the, the motions are kind of converging, but this, has, this is not necessarily easy to see because the, the, the cloud will be, uh, sorry, the cluster will be embedded. But anyway, the proper motions of these guys indeed is, is converging. But once the, the, the cluster starts converging, then the proper motions become a mess. Uh, and you get kind of a random thing, a, 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 a very chaotic uh, system in which the, the, the stars have whatever motion. So uh, why, why is this so? Well, precisely because of violent relaxation. We have here the potential in arbitrary units, the rotational potential. You have here uh, the total potential is given by the solid line. The gas potential is given by the and the dotted line is the potential of the star. So you see that the at the position of the cluster here is, is where the cluster forms. Uh, the, the potential increases, or well, the, the, the well increases uh, and becomes steeper and steeper uh, as, as time goes on. But also, um, well, you see that it's varying in time. And this is what is exactly what produces the fact that, that the velocity dispersion has to be constant. That the, the fact that the, the gravitational potential varies on time is what produces the, the same velocity dispersion independently of the mass of the stars. OK, uh, what about the expansion factor of this region as a function of time? Well, if we, if we compute this, the expansion factor I, that I told you, and we remember that the Orion Nebula cluster has a small expansion factor. Well, what will be the expansion factor of this, of this cluster? Well, here you have the result. At the beginning, you have a negative expansion factor implying that there is contraction. After this, the clusters start to merge and start to, me, to make the, this mess, then the expansion factor goes nearly zero and then oscillates. And this is because the cluster is under construction and the, and the potential well is still making, making an effect, it's getting deeper and deeper. Then the stars merge and, 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 and orbit like a cluster, no? Uh, and then there are some times in which the expansion factor is positive, sometimes in which the expansion factor is negative, but the values are very small. 
here you see uh, different lines. The solid line is the 3D computational data uh, of, this, of this equation, uh, is the actual result. Uh, in 2D, we have made different projections and in different directions to see whether uh, the, 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 the result stands depending on the projection in which you analyze the, the results in 2D as if you were observing. And of course, if you, since you are making we are making different uh, projections. Then we have statistics. So the the gray the gray zone is the is the one sigma deviation. The the, the light zone is the is the three sigma deviation, and the dashed line is the mean. So you see that even uh, even if you have, for instance, positive or negative. Um, the uh, expansion factor you still can compute wrongly just because of the projection you are using at, at some time you can get wrongly the, the an expansion factor that it's uh, the other that has the other sign so but i think that the relevant point here is that this cluster is under construction in this construction the the velocities of the stars get random and uh, and you can compute either positive or negative around zero, very close to zero. So that doesn't really mean whether the cluster is really expanding or not at this time. We know that this cluster at this time is still is, is, is forming. We don't have feedback, so the gas is not getting rid and the potential well is, is, is getting deeper and deeper. So in this sense, this picture that you have to see necessarily uh, contraction motion is motions is not true, especially if you are in the process of actually having many stars that are that that are mixed. On the other hand, about the cloud dispersal, uh, what you can see is that, for instance, this is the um, lambda ori is not the same region; it's close, it's uh, it's a little bit north. Uh, lambda ori is is a cluster that has already got rid of the gas. The, uh, there is no more gas in the middle, and the gas there is a shell of gas around it, uh, which is forming another new clusters. By the way, but the, the interesting thing is that the stars in this lambda ori cluster are expanding, are expanding, and, and the farther they are from the center, they are faster. Uh, their velocities are faster, and this you can also see this in the simulations. In the simulations, you have you, you evacuate the gas and the stars that which had at the beginning some velocity dispersion some at some point you got rid of the potential and then they have an excess of kinetic energy and they start moving away so you can picture this in this way here we have we are forming the cluster the potential well is very deep they have velocity dispersions consistent with this collapse but then as you evacuate the gas the the potential well moves you you move the the potential well the, now it's the the, the 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 deepest part is far away and the stars expand because they don't feel anymore this this well in this position and actually some of them starts accelerating to other places this is a work that we made with uh, uh, manuel zamora uh, so what about the stellar ages well Cromwell uh, was arguing that you have a, an important population uh, of stars having large ages, much larger than the freefall time. Where here uh, there are two different uh, solutions to, the pro to this problem. First of all, the models th uh, that you use to compute stellar evolution and to compute ages may differ by a factor of two or three in the stellar ages. For, for instance, here we have MIS models of stellar evolution that, uh, that use uh, Jesus Hernandez. And you see that our age histograms have, uh, uh, have a peak here around uh, between, between three and, and, and five million years. If you go to other kind of models like Parsec, which are similar to those uh, to these models that that Kromholtz used, the ages are a little bit older. So let me switch between one of them. So you can see that the stellar models do not allow us to really distinguish whether these stars have really uh, six eight million years or uh, or whether they are younger. So. Um, so we believe that you cannot rely on these stellar ages, given the uncertainties that we have. 
nowadays. On the other hand, there is another problem that Enrique has insisted uh, many times, in which the freefall time that, that Krumholz computes to criticize our work is that uh, the, 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 the crossing time is very small. If you take uh, a density of 10 to the 4, which is the density of the nebula uh, uh, behind the, the, the Orion Nebula cluster, then the freefall time is 0.34. If you have stellar ages of 5 or 6, then this, this is 20 times the freefall time. Of course, uh, uh, if you think in this way, well, yes, the Orion Nebula cluster seems to be really old. However, we are not saying that the collapse starts at this, at this density. The collapse starts from the largest scales with lower densities. And then uh, at those lower densities, uh, the freefall time is much more consistent with the stellar ages that you get. So, um, I think that it's kind of a trick just uh, saying these, uh, these criticisms about the, the, the stellar ages. Uh, the other problem that, that was uh, posed to, to our model is that the clouds are always less dense than the stellar clusters. Well, here there are two issues. Uh, on, on one hand, the stellar cluster, as we have seen, is built up by the merging of different clusters that are nearby. So they can form far away or, well, not far away, close, but in different places. And as they merge, they get denser, of course. So they get dense because they are uh, converging and they are merging and they can be denser, of course, uh, than the parent cloud. But also there are other three effects. On one, hand, on one hand, you can exhaust gas because you are converting dense gas into stars. Then the mass of the, of, the, of the inner region is getting smaller and smaller, and the mass in the stars is getting larger and larger. On the other hand, you can have gas evacuation if, if you have a feedback uh, from the stars. But also, there is also an, a, embodied dynamics. The, 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 the nature of the embodied uh, the dynamics is that it tends to get a compact core and eject uh, uh, stars and, and get a, a diffuse halo. So that may uh, make build up finally a, a, a more dense cluster than a cluster uh, than the density than the mean density of the of the cloud of the parent cloud. Uh, in order to show that at least uh, this convergence of of clusters can give you larger densities, we compute the density of stars and the density ga of gas around circles of different sizes. So the main density here, the main density here, and the main density here uh, of, of both gas and stars at different times and, and see how is the evolution in our simulation. So here you have the time in terms of the freefall time of the initial freefall time, the, the time at the beginning of the simulation, and you have the density here. So for large ra radii, you have that the, the density of the stars is always smaller than the density of the gas. But for small enough radii, then you, you see that although at the beginning, the density of stars is small, as the clusters uh, merge, then the density of the stars becomes larger than the density of the gas in the region. The density on the, of the gas in, in the region is not allowed to increase because we are converting the stars into gas into stars. And also, well, uh, that, that, that prevents the density of the gas to increase, of course. Uh, while the, the, the density of the stars can keep increasing just because you have more and more stars that are falling into the potential well. So uh, finally, let me show you that uh, there is also each segregation. This was not criticized by Cromwell. Uh, I'm just showing it uh, as, as another result that we had. Uh, in, in Orion, we have each segregation, and all the uh, younger stars, the embedded stars, are following the structure, the inner structure of the, of the gas. No? Uh, but, the, but the more important thing is that there is an age segregation. So you have the cluster with the, the youngest stars in the middle and the, the older stars are spread around. And this is, uh, in, the, in the case of the turbulent simulations, you will have something that it's much more spread in the whole, in the whole region. No? Uh, there is no preference to have uh, older stars here, uh, sorry, younger stars here and, and older over here. Everything is kind of, uh, of uh, uh, well mixed. 
in the case of the collapse, you have uh, age, age segregation. The younger stars are in the middle and the older stars are statistically farther away. So in summary, let me finish and, and go to the, to the questions. Uh, we think that we have observational and theoretical evidence that clouds are in collapse. Uh, the, what we call the turbulent motions, which should be properly called non-thermal motions, are in reality could be very well uh, a consequence of chaotic collapse, collapse that is not spherical. And uh, we believe that we have addressed uh, some important criticisms that has been made to, to the model. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Javi. <laughs> okay, can we see some hands for questions? I think Luis Aguilar is asking something. Uh, okay, um, so we have, I can see uh, Will Henny. Uh, Will, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Javier. Uh, very interesting talk. Unfortunately, I missed the beginning of it, but I think I saw enough um, to understand it. I have a, a question. I don't think, I'm, I'm not sure if you answered it earlier, but does your model make any predictions okay. about the power spectrum maybe, or other turbulent, um, other statistical parameters of the velocities or the density fields that might allow um, it to be distinguished from the, the turbulent model? No, we, we didn't compute any, any power spectrum or, or anything like that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that this is something that we, we should do at some point, no? to, to, to check whether Collapse can reproduce a power spectrum, spectrum that looks like turbulent spectrum. Mm -hmm. yeah. a, a chaotic uh, collapse is not a spherical one. No, uh, this is a okay. more chaotic collapse. Yeah. Okay. And the second okay, question about yeah. Orion in particular, um, it's known that in Orion there have been multiple generations of star formation. That, is, is that sort of something that's included in your model or are, are you just modeling one particular burst? Well, you know, uh, we are not modeling a burst. We are modeling the, the collapse and happens what happens. So what we have is different bursts in different places that then merge. So okay. we feel that uh, actually this is a discussion that we have right now with Pavel Pokropa because as soon as Andrea posted the, uh, her paper in, in the Astro PH, once it was accepted, Pavel came with, with an email telling, you know, we have computed these three populations in Orion. So what they say is that Orion has been formed by first the first, a first collapse and a first generation of stars. Then you have the ionizing sources that evacuate the gas. But since the massive stars at some point get ejected, then you eject the, the, the massive star and then the cloud starts again collapsing because it has no, no more support and then forms a second generation and so on. No? So three, like uh, three different generations. Uh, our take of this is, uh, well, we, we are not experts on observations. Our expert, with, which is uh, Lee, uh, which are Lee and, and Jesus, they both kind of agree that somehow it could be very well what Krop and his group uh, neglect or argue that is not, which is the binarity. No? So the, the binarity of the stars can increase the luminosity and make uh, apparently a second um, uh, main sequence. And then you, you believe that there is a second population. So this is one part. I have no feelings on that because I have no idea of what are the uncertainties of the data and so on. No? Uh, That's possible, but hand... there's other evidence, for instance, there are stars that seem to have been ejected uh, from the Orion cluster maybe three or four million years ago. Um, Wait, which... I, there's, I think, Mu, Mu Carl and A. Origo. Mm -hmm. um, that are, they're, but they're both a long way from Orion now, but they're mm -hmm. consistent with being having ejected being ejected at about mm -hmm. the same time that Iota Orionis was formed. Um, okay. so. and, and the proper motions are consistent also with that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, that, well, that's interesting. And they, they actually say that maybe uh, the Theta Orion 1C or whatever name it has, 
is also been ejected at this time, no? So, no, no, no. That's well, not what Crom well, says well, that. this That's is, not this what, is what Kropa says in, her, in his email. So I don't know. But anyway, no, no, what, no. I, what I want to tell you is that that's true, and I'm not against that. I think that the proper way to compute this, because we don't have so complex simulations, is to use a code like Amuse, which we are trying to, to implement now, to have feedback, to have the embody dynamics, to see whether we can actually really eject and in, and in how many cases. No, because so, so far I have the feeling that Cropa has no the hydrodynamics or the MHD, if he has only mm -hmm. the embody, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But we, you need mm -hmm. everything together no? to see whether yeah, sure. you, you can reproduce that. Okay. Yeah, but it's an interesting topic. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Uh, Enrique? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, uh, I, I was forgetting. Uh, it, I think this is partially a response to to Will's question, to the first question by Will, uh, on whether there should be any special signature for the gas. That, that's part of what Ruben is doing as part of his PhD thesis. And it's very interesting because it might be possible, we haven't done it yet, but it might be possible that the spectrum, the turbulent energy spectrum for turbulence driven by collapse might be steeper than, than regular uh, uniformly driven turbulence. And that is because what we have realized is that the, the turbulence the, 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 during the collapse, the turbulent the injection rate is increasing over time. And so the standard Kolmogorov turbulence assumes a uniform or a, a, a constant rate of steering of the turbulence. But when you have an increasing turbulent injection rate, then it is possible that the injection rate and the dissipation are a little bit out of balance. That's what we argued in, in Ruben's first paper. And that would, might, have, might have the consequence of, of giving you a steeper spectrum. That's something that we need to check. But it's a possibility, so it's a very interesting question. Thanks, Enrique. Do we have uh, any questions in the auditorium? Yes, please. Could I ask a question? Oh, uh, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hi. Yes, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting to, to listen to. Um, uh, could you, uh, you know, make it more clear for me at least? Do you have some restrictions for the mass of the clouds? Because Orion is a rather low mass cluster, right? So in your model, could you explain you know, dense compact clusters with large masses, more than 10 to the five, let's say. Well, yeah, we, we haven't been focusing in, in trying to reproduce what we see in the local neighborhood. So at, at, in, the, in the Milky Way, not in other galaxies or, or larger clusters. So certainly we haven't done a bigger masses and bigger cluster with, which will also maybe require a larger energy inputs and, and so on, no? Uh, no, we are not modeling these huge star forming regions or so on, yeah. Another question, because you discussed, you know, this during the collapse and then, you know, this some kind of expansion. Does this imply that you don't form uh, bound clusters? Well, that will depend on, on whether you convert the, all the gas into stars or whether you can dissipate the gas before it's converted into stars and, and then you get uh, rid of the gravitational potential. No? So if you, if you dissipate the gas, which usually happens in the, in the local neighborhood, you don't have so dense things that, uh, so, so you form a few stars, massive stars, and then dissipate the cloud. And then of course, you, you, your result is, a, is an unbound cluster, no? Yeah. It, it looks to me that it is more applicable for open clusters than for superstar or globular clusters. Yeah, yes, I mean, it, yeah. 
we are focusing in this in this uh, in this work. We are mostly trying to address Orion you know, Nebula cluster. No, but uh, I I guess if you want to do bigger things, more massive clusters, and so on, maybe even the galactic potential has to be taken into account. No, uh, in this case we we are not taking into account any any large scale on galactic scale. I mean, uh, formation of the cluster. No. And the fraction of the gas, well, uh, the residual gas, which is going well, the cluster loses during the collapse, is a free parameter in your calculations? Sorry, which? Uh, the fraction of the ejected uh, gas. No, it's, uh, I mean, uh, we have different simulations. In the, in the, in the turbulent and the collapse simulation, simple collapse simulations, we just have collapse, we don't have any feedback but still allow us to compute the velocity expression of the stars and so on. We also have some, some, some simulations with feedback and then the gas is, eject, is ejected. In this case, the, the, the efficiencies goes up to 10, 20% more or less, uh, not larger than that. Of course, that depends on what do you assume for the feedback. Uh, and I think yeah. there is a lot of tricks right there, and and we really don't know what uh, what will be the best uh, prescription for feedback. No, uh, right now we are trying to implement Torch, this code by by Mordecai McLeod and collaborators, which use Amuse, uh, we, uh, I mean Embody and Flash, um, in order to have the whole thing, not to have the Embody, the, the, the magnetohydrodynamics, but also the, the dispersal of the cloud. I think that that will give you the, 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 a better answer on, on, on how these things evolve, whether there are different populations and so on. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks for you. Thanks, Sergey. Um, okay, we have a question from Diwaka. Hi, Javier. Hi. Uh, very nice talk. So uh, um, I think my question is very related to what uh, Sergey asked. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you you showed that the density of stars is much more than the, the gas. That's one of the criticism that you mentioned. So that applies even for these kind of Orion clusters or you referred only to these super clusters what Sergey was uh, mentioning? I, well, my feeling is that this mechanism can operate uh, in, in, in any cluster. No? You, if you construct a large, because I, I was uh, thinking in, in, in the question of Sergey, uh, if you have a large region, like I don't remember the names of the, uh, in, in our galaxy, there is a region that is huge, like 100 parsecs, and it's forming stars like crazy. But I mean, if you have a large re region and you allow for, for, the, for the formation of the cluster, then, well, uh, for, of a single cluster out of that, then the cluster will be larger, uh, will have larger density that in, than any other uh, cloud. No? So in principle, this worked very well for, for our simulations without the need of feedback, without the need of, 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 uh, of detailed embodied dynamics. But I believe that even if you allow for that, then you increase the, 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 the effect because embody will make you comp more compact and more dense uh, objects just because you, you are hitting the, the the stars, you are ejecting some stars, and the and the cluster gets compact, more compact. No, so that's that's one part. The other part will be that you are getting rid of the gas, and then of course you never allow to get gas dense enough mm -hmm. in, on on the scales of the cluster. So I think that all the, all of the effects work in that sense to to make clusters denser denser than what the clouds that we see. Yeah, so this, uh, what will be a typical time scale for uh, all these uh, stars or subclusters? I, I would not say what are the over what time? spatial scale it can yeah. happen. Yeah, uh, the, the simulations that we made are for thinking in our solar neighborhood. So we are thinking in clusters of one parsec of size uh, with a thousand, a thousand stars. And uh, the scales are around one freefall time, which means uh, one million years or so, okay. more or less. Yeah, okay. but I guess the scheme will work at, at different densities too, with different time scales only. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have one final question from Roberto. 
Uh, yes, I, I was just uh, thinking on this, and then people started to ask on that. Um, probably there is a systematic, that I don't know if it's important or not, that is that when you define the sink particles, I guess you are counting all the sink particle mass as stellar mass, when in reality, you know, uh, for the first million years or so that we have pro protostellar protostars, uh, uh, you have an, an envelope and, 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 an, and an object that is the protostar itself. So the, the abstraction that the simulations make of, of considering that all the, all the mass that goes to the sink particle is a star in this type of context, probably is better if one makes a distinction that a fraction of that mass will be stellar already, and a fraction of that mass, which is the majority in the earlier stages, will be gaseous. gaseous. Uh, so, so, so if you consider that, say, one third of, of your mass that is in your sink particle is really the envelope mass, and only a fraction of that is the protostar itself, probably your ratios will be such that you have a different stellar mass. Um, but I don't know if it will affect, and probably it will affect only for the inner, inner radii. And then when you take larger annulus, then the gas dominates anyway. So I, I don't know if it will be important, but um, it's, possible you... that, it's possible that you are overestimating your stellar mass. That's, that's the comment, yeah. <clears throat> In terms of the, of the efficiency, you mean the efficiency yes. of transformation? Yes, yeah. because not all the not all the sink particle mass is formally stellar. Yeah. No? It's yeah, an yeah. That, yeah, that, that's, that's, yeah, yeah, I will agree completely with that. Yeah, our efficiencies are, are overestimated in that sense. Okay, thanks, Roberto. Uh, so let us thank our speaker again for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So everyone, have a good afternoon. <laughs> Okay, bye everyone. Bye.